So you're taking off and now you're 90 degrees and the mountain's coming up on you. That's very uncomfortable for people. And if you haven't been told that's what's gonna happen, the thing that you are going to do to make that picture look right is step on the rudder. Right. Because you're just like, all of a sudden you're just like, oh, that doesn't, how come I'm not turning? I'm gonna make that look better. I'm gonna give it a little red. And then now your ball's pegged and it's like, and then, and you're losing some airspeed and you have the very real potential of stall spinning it into the ground. And you just, I mean, there's a couple people that have lived through a stall spin, but it's not a long list. Welcome to the Coffee in a Hanger podcast. Today's subject is mountain flying, and this conversation is for entertainment purposes only. It is wise to hire an instructor who is a mountain flying and landing expert before venturing into this type of flying for the first time. Our guest today is Matt Keller. He's the owner of Blue Ice Aviation, and for the past 20 years has been flying alongside his legendary bush pilot father-in-law. They fly their clients to hundreds of tiny strips in the Talkeetna and Chugach Mountains. Enjoy. I, I, so I, I read your, I read your uh, little sheet that you sent me. I started reading it and I was like, oh, I'll just craft a couple questions here. You know, this is, this is good. And then as I read it more, I was like kind of humbling myself and thinking like, there's, a, there's so many things I don't even know that I don't know as a, as a pilot, right? And I go fly in the mountains all the time, and it's pretty much all I do. Right, yeah. So, I do I have the respect that I should for this? And I would love today to be about you telling me why the heck it's so dangerous. Hmm. You know, because I, I don't know if I have that respect. Yeah, I would really love to just have a conversation about my problems with the word safety. My problems with the word safety, and the way that culturally it it, you know, it means almost nothing. And I think it almost acts to work against successful outcomes personally. Mm -hmm. When you yeah. look through like the federal system for safety, it focuses on policy. And you're like, well, that's interesting. Policy. Like, how do you take policy? How do you put like, how do you make enough rules to keep somebody safe when they're flying a super cub in the mountains? I, uh, you you could not so, have enough So rules. how, how mm. absurd is that? Is that absurd? It's, it's, it depends on your skill level is what it comes down mm -hmm. to, right? And so when you're a young pilot that doesn't have any experience, um, I think that policy is the only way forward because initially you're gonna have to have some guardrails. You're gonna have to have somebody say to you, hey, um, Matt, you know, you have like a total of, of, of 62 hours and really your crosswind component maximum right now is, is 11 knots. Like that's right. very reasonable. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then so initially you go out with these guardrails and hey, you shouldn't fly in like less than this visibility and you shouldn't, all these things. But like I was in a situation this week where it was a sketchy landing because of wind and the wind was blowing about seven. Yeah. Why was it sketch in what, give me the scenario because I don't understand how wind would be sketchy at seven. <clears throat> so you're in, a, you're in a tight valley. You've looked at windy TY. You're aware that the wind at 10,000 feet is just ripping, like it's really mm -hmm. blowing. And then you're down at like 4,000 feet, right? So those mountains sticking up into that 10,000 foot zone is catching, is, is catching the air. And it's just spinning off all these little, whether you want to call them little tornadoes, dust, willowas, whatever we want to call them as Alaskans, but you, uh, and sometimes you can see that in the snow, but those little air segments are out there floating around invisibly for me to find on final. Mm -hmm. So that's and so the, that's you, the and so you're big, coming into land and may, maybe you had a tailwind or a headwind whatever yeah. depending on the case but you are like oh my ground speed is 57 my air speed's 50 whatever the case may be but at any moment I could have I have a tailwind now at any moment I could have a headwind of or, 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 or sorry I have a headwind now at any moment I could have a tailwind right. of, of 10 or 15 and just right. like a wind shear. Right, and, it, and really it was, the, the, in short, the reason that it was not great was because it was like seven gust 20 mm -hmm. or seven gust 25. Yeah. But you would have never known that because the gusts would be like 10 minutes apart, mm -hmm. right? So, so because so you, you be, could have come around and checked out a strip and sort of assess the wind. Which is what I totally did. Like I stayed airborne, like, cause you're aware, you're like, okay, the wind is ripping upstairs. I've hit a couple of bumps. I've seen a couple of willowas. 
I'm just going to auger around up here above the strip. I'm going to drag it this way. I'm going to drag it. And I had a passenger with me, and they're just like, what are we doing now? Are we going to land now? You know, this sort of stuff. And it's like, are you landing? Are you landing? And I'm like, no, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just like wandering. I'm just feeling yeah, it out, bro. Yeah. I'm feeling it out. And so that's kind of. What is a will a while? I think, I think that's like a, maybe that's, I think that's terminology for are the you illusions. Used? Oh, okay. And I and think it's, it's just basically like a dust devil or a. Yeah, a, like a, a crazy like burst of air that is kind of. Yeah. Got kind of left field. And, yeah. So you have a passenger and they're just like, oh, what, what's, what's the deal? What's he doing? Why aren't you landing? You know, and it's like, I just, I'm just not sure yet if I want to land. Like, I kind of want to feel this out a little bit. So I did. I drug it a couple times one way, drug it a couple times the other way. And in that scenario, opted to land uh, with the tailwind because the wind had made the airstrip so rough, just so rough. It's kind of a one way strip. So it's a bit of a better snow one. And so I just landed with the tail end because I had the space. And then you kind of, I slid out. How did you bumps. run, how <laughs> did you drag a strip both ways when it's a one-way strip? Well, I'm sorry. It's one-way takeoff. You can take off both ways, but not loaded. And this is my own terminology. But if you have a runway, you can take off and land both directions. I call it 100% runway. Oh, a 75% runway yeah. is one that I can take off, or excuse me, I can land both directions. I can land downhill, I can land uphill, and I can take off downhill. That's 75%. That's great. Yeah. And then there's 50% runways, which are, you're going to always land going this way, and you're going to always take off going that way. Mm -hmm. And a 25% runway, well, that's, that's a crash. <laughs> 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 because there's no takeoff involved. <laughs> so I thought you were going to say that it, you can take off uh, one, both ways, light, or, and you can land one way or something like it, Yeah. And that would also be a possible sure, scenario? Sure. Totally. It, yeah. The difference between saying, I can land there and I can work off of that runway. Oh, that's, yeah. a, that's a big difference. Huge difference. That's Huge a workable difference. runway. Yeah. All the runways I know about, I, that I've seen pictures of you landing on and stuff, yeah. they're all workable runways. They're, like they're all the ones I've out. ever landed probably, right? <laughs> At my level, like <laughs> those I don't are know, all... man. I don't so know, man. Because like you're out there, you're pretty light on fuel. Right. True. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You're in, I mean, you have a great little airplane and you fly enough to be proficient and you've been around. I'm sure I'm totally confident that you've got into places that we would not work. Yeah. Maybe. Because it's not too hard. Because people think like, oh, if you're an air taxi guy, you know, you're just always constantly in there at 150 foot, you know, you're, you're like, you 150 know, feet. gross weight. Do you ever land in a like, 150 foot spot? Is that a thing? I mean, I, I don't know. I just, I, like, these people have way bigger feet than I do or something. I'll tell you what. When I, I mean, I'm just a kid. I'm only 44. But when uh -huh. I started just in the early 2000s, they, they didn't have the SQs, and, mm -hmm. you know. And it was a little different. If you, if I, I was at a, there was a time when if I saw a set of tracks, I was like, oh, I, I'm pretty confident that I could land too. Mm -hmm. But now a set of tracks is like. Doesn't mean anything. It sure means a whole bunch less. It's like yeah. that guy. I mean, I have some friends. They got those SQs and stuff. They had this fishing hole they wanted me to go to. It was just funny. I mean, the guy had like 400 hours maybe total time. Yeah. Right? 400 That's hours so total funny, time. Dude. He goes, we got this fishing hole, Matt. Yeah, I, come on. Let's go. He goes, I, I even think you could land there. He told me that. <laughs> and it's like, was wow. he joking at all, or was did he understand the, he, like the how funny that he is? He was joking a little bit, but the but but really the equipment, man. Yeah, the equipment the equipment's better. Yeah. It's remarkable. Mm -hmm. It's insane. Let's let's just like back up a little bit and let's talk about cause, so because I want to get just a little picture of like who you are. Yeah, your dad is a, a so, Air Force pilot. So my dad was drafted in Vietnam. Okay, and he ended up in the Air Force mm -hmm. and ended up in Alaska flying for the Air National Guard and never had to go overseas. And what yeah. does he do now? He did all sorts of stuff. Dad, 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 dad said he never, I mean, he's 70, almost 78, and he says he doesn't know what he's going to do when he grows up. So mm. he's done everything. <clears throat> so I grew up with, with these photos of dad's planes on the wall. And then he got out of the Air Force, and then we moved to Wainwright and Point Hope. Mm -hmm. And dad had a Cessna 207 and a little construction company. And he flew around on the North Slope for a number of years. And that's kind of when I was born. Um, honestly, my very, very earliest memory is being in a Cessna 207. I think we were somewhere in Canada flying down to Wisconsin for the winter or something mm -hmm. like this. Yeah, I just grew up with a dad who, who, okay. who, who loved to fly. And then my brother and I decided to be missionary pilots. And then you at some point met your wife. Yeah. I met Samantha in high school. 
Yeah, and 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 that's Mike and Meekin's you, daughter. Were and, you all already uh, flying a cub around at that point? Or no, you... I think I had a. I was either I was getting my pilot's license. I think when I met her, mm -hmm. it was something like that. And so you were wanting to fly when you were like before you met her. Oh yeah, totally. And did you have some sort of a kind of oh man her dad is so cool because he is so cool but i mean like did you have that she claimed i wouldn't give her the time of day till i learned she was mike meekin's oh daughter. really that's what she claimed what but i mean is it kind of true i mean not not well, that you wouldn't give her the mike time of day like, but i mean was he big time for you like, for me he was big time all you? because of that alaska bush pilots book i don't see you know but the alaska bush pilots book and it has like the there's this photo of Mike. He's on skis. He's landing like on this ridge. It's just, just a sick picture. It's just yeah. awesome. And I was like, whoa, that guy, right? Mm -hmm. So no, he was total legend. The most remarkable thing about Mike is, um, I think that November seven five eight zero Yankee, the Super Cub, that he's still flying today. Mm -hmm. He, um, that's the one that he soloed in. I want to say in maybe seventy six or seventy seven, something like that. He has in seven five eight zero Yankee that same serial number Super Cub. An honest 25,000. I bet you he's somewhere between 25 and 30,000 hours in that serial number. That's that he has. That that's he has not in that. How many hours and that's the airplane not some has Joe on. Blow exaggerating numbers. That's like going to his logbooks and just counting the engines he's installed on it. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I mean, what is So like he's gone 12, through like 13. <laughs> he's TVO'd every one. Yeah. He's never, I don't think he's ever pulled one off early. Wow. Amazing. Yeah, that is cool. And, and I guess that's impressive just to fill in the gaps there a little bit. It's impressive because he's never trashed that airplane. So, and then you've been flying with him side by side for how many years now? Yeah, uh, this will be uh, 21, I think. This will be 21 years. <laughs> that is so nuts. It is nuts because... That is crazy. You have a tremendous amount of experience. Well, for, you know I mean? And the crazy thing about it is how much I got to shortcut. Yeah. Well, that's, got, that's true because it's... You couldn't, like, Mike had to do school of hard knocks, man, for mm -hmm. him to get to, any, right? And I just got to come in. I had a flying degree. Not that that college matters that boy. much. Here but it comes least, college boy. Right. <laughs> but at least you got some footing, right? You have some, like, you're not, I wasn't just yeah. a kid. Like, I had a five-year degree. I'm married to his daughter. He wants to teach me, mm -hmm. and I just yeah. get to follow him around. And then mm -hmm. on top of that, the guy that gave Mike, his commercial certificate, Gar Passell, who is uh, 88, mm -hmm. very good friend of mine. And so, but to have a guy like Gar that had been shadowing Mike and had learned so much from watching him. And he's a teacher. And he's a teacher. So he yeah. takes on, and then he takes me out on the airstrips and just one after another, he'd go out and just work me, work me, work me. The airstrips he, meaning? Like all over the Talkeetan Mountains, Chugach Mountains. Like the, the airstrips. The airstrips. The, the secret list. The secret list. <laughs> I'll, I'll, find, I'll find at least ten of them by the time I'm by the time I die. <laughs> I'll find them, bro. It, <laughs> I will find them. Yeah, it's a funny thing. No, but um, yeah, that's actually crazy. I think that's a really good way to learn. Is instead of being like, "Oh, I'm going to teach you some concepts and stuff," of being like, "Oh, here's ten strips. I'm going to show you like sort of an orientation about this site." The wind, different types of days, totally. different types of, you know, visibility and approaching. And, and I would ride stuff. with him and then yeah. he would ride with me yeah. and then he would get out and have a handheld and, and then watch me do the approach. And so he was like um, checking you out on these strips, essentially? Con yes, but only a select, the ones that were close to the house because it's, we didn't, it is because it's expensive and we, it is a business. So it's like. Yeah. We'd go out, we wouldn't wander all that far, but... The um, close to the house up at Cheat Mountain? Yeah. Like which one, for example? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is. Because uh, as a guy that had a, a degree in aviation, but it was all Cessnas, and yeah. Cessnas don't fly like Super Cubs, yeah. man. Super Cubs have a landing switch, you know? They're like the throttle, like, go like that, and then you hit the ground, where a Cessna, it's like... A Cessna keeps flying. A Cessna, like, you actually have to land a Cessna. You fly them onto the ground. What do you think... Um, so... What did you learn in that first year that sort of surprised you from school? Like, what did oh, you learn? What did you unlearn? It, it, it's probably not surprising. What immediately comes to mind is that uh, Moody Aviation was an awesome training, uh, mm -hmm. very numbers-based, very policy-based, really. It was mm -hmm. a system that was teaching flight through 
systems, very exacting system. Mm -hmm. And that certainly has its place. But in, in uh, learning to trust, learning to trust the seat of your pants. Yeah, just sort of learning how to be, what I got from your thing here is your little blurb that you sent me about yeah. safety is that judgment and sort of that, and that comes from experience, right? Yeah. Um, is, is huge. Mm -hmm. And so how do you build judgment? Right. Good judgment comes from experience and experience comes from bad judgment. It's funny, but it's, there's a lot of truth in it. If you start with, let's just say, a student pilot who has no judgment. Again, mm -hmm. they have to be given rules. You have to go out and exercise and, and learn flight inside of these guardrails yeah. and tight parameters. But then there comes a day where, for the first time, you're out flying and the winds come up at Palmer and you come back and all of a sudden you're outside of what you were comfortable with and you're forced into, you're forced into the segment of flight that you weren't expecting and didn't really want, but now you're there. You didn't do anything wrong. It's just, here we are, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's one, I really reject ideas like, oh, well, don't do anything you're not comfortable with and stuff like this, because sometimes I'm like, that happens all, I mean, you're gonna do stuff, if you can't do stuff you're not comfortable mm -hmm. with, you're not gonna do anything. You're never gonna grow. And and, I, and I've been told that a yeah, fair okay, bit. Yeah, okay, I have questions about that. Keep going. Yeah. yeah, and so you, you so experience is built as a person, um, it just has more life experiences in the airplane and has to deal with scenarios that they weren't expecting, right? right? So um, ta let's talk about building, because like, that's really interesting to me when you say you disagree with people saying don't do things that are out of your comfort zone. How do you get out of your comfort zone in a, in a sorry, I don't want to use the word safe because I'm right, going against no, no. that too. You know? Man, <laughs> I feel like I'm walking on eggshells <laughs> here. <laughs> So how do I how how do you get out of your comfort zone in a way that's pr productive to being um, less dangerous? Yeah, isn't it's such a great question, and this is there's not enough rules in the world to make a person safe yep. in the complex flying environment that we're going to deal with in Alaska. Okay, there's, that's what I'm trying to say. So in the in the, in the, the fact that you can't ha possibly have enough rules to keep you safe in all the different complex flight scenarios that mm -hmm. could get you in trouble in Alaska. That it has to come back to the pilot. It has to come back to what's going on between these ears. Like what always, when you think about, like when you think about what is safety, I immediately go to the things that are gonna kill me. It's gonna be like, because I lost control of the aircraft in a turn, or I misjudged the winds in the mountains, um, and the winds had their way with me. It's, or, you know, or, uh, or I wasn't paying attention and it was really flat light and I smacked the side of a white hill. I just didn't see it. I was not mm -hmm. IFR, I wasn't even in the clouds, it just all of a sudden the ground was there. And whack, you know? Mm -hmm. Like those are the things that are gonna take you out. And so all that comes down to, all of those scenarios and avoiding those scenarios comes down to the pilot's ability to negotiate with the physical world and negotiate accurately. Like to take in the data points that are coming in, know which ones are important, know which ones aren't important, and then make like appropriate judgment. So really it comes down to deductive reasoning yeah. on the pilot's end. And not everybody is very good at deductive reasoning. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying I'm the best. I'm saying I've learned how to survive mm -hmm. through the abilities that I have. I'm thankful for yeah. that. But I, and so in this world where everybody can always do everything, I'm kind of like, well, I don't know if that's necessarily uh, true if you're going to work with a small light aircraft in the mountains. You keep saying in the mountains and you primarily, that's what you do. Yeah. Um, so let's focus this conversation entirely on flying in the mountains. Okay. And bush flying, you know, just clarity for the, for the viewer. That's what we're talking about. We're Great. not talking about any flat land pattern work or anything like that. We're talking about flying, landing on 300 foot upslope strips in the mountains, yep. tight valleys, tight stuff like that. Okay, okay great. So yep. you, you told me you're passionate about acknowledging how dangerous mountain flying in a small single engine airplane is and identifying your kill points. And you just talked about some of those. Yeah. Can we clarify that? Like how, da tell me mm -hmm. how dangerous it is. I'm, hey Matt, I just got a super cub, I'm ready. Yeah. Bro, let's go. Let's go land in the mountains. And, and I'm too, a little too eager. Right. Okay. <laughs> Talk me down off the ledge. I'm a little too eager. 
Boy, that's a great, that's a great scenario. Let's, let's assume it's a good weather day. Let's assume that we're just dealing with man and machine. Mm. You've got the machine, you've got a super cup. It will do mountains and it will do them well. Mm. But at 80 hours, you want to proceed with extreme caution because you're not sure what, you probably think more highly of what that super cup will do than what it will actually do. And this is largely due to winds. Winds are going to be the complicating factor. I just said we're in a beautiful, but let's now let's enter some wind. I've spent large segments of days full throttle in the Super Cub just because you're trying to work, do a sheep survey or something, and you're on the downwind side of a mountain and you're just like full throttle, sometimes for like an and hour. And you're going like 65. Oh, slower than that. <laughs> yeah. You know great. what I mean? You're just full just... throttle, you're heavy on gas, you got a passenger, and you're just augering along. And mm. That, you know, um, and meaning, so this airspeed thing, the reason I bring yeah, that up is yeah. because you're literally in a climb. Totally. The nose is up. You're in a climb, but you're maintaining not altitude. Yes. Yeah. Totally. So if you're going to go into the mountains as a, as a young pilot, as a low time pilot uh, in a super cub, winds are just such a huge thing, man. If I can lay out one scenario, mm -hmm. you know, like a, for example, um, Gar Passell, 88-year-old guy that taught me how to fly the Super Cub, uh, his good buddy got into doing a little bit of air taxi and some hunters. Mm -hmm. um, and it was his very first commercial flight in the Chugach Mountains. And in those days, you could still land. It must have been before the state park because he was landing in Ship Creek. And the classic south wind through the mm -hmm. mountains. Jim took off in the Super Cub, initiated the climb, of course. And then you're taking off because the air's coming down the valley. You're going to take off going up valley right and then you start this turn and you're picking up a you're picking up a tailwind the whole time and so mm -hmm. your turn your turn initially feels really good the first 90 degrees of the turn actually feel great right the second 90 degrees does not feel great it's no different than a boat going upstream in a river you make the turn the boat initially goes boop, and turns great 90 degrees and then just stops turning and all of a sudden the bank is coming towards you that's because as your ground speed doubles the radius of your turn quadruples and so the, the, the problem comes that when you're 90 degrees, when you're, so you're taking off and now you're 90 degrees and the mountain's coming up on you, that's very uncomfortable for people. And if you haven't been told that's what's going to happen, the thing that you are going to do to make that picture look right is step on the rudder. Right. Or step on the right. You know, you're going to try to bring it around. That's such a scary moment because I've been in that situa situation where I'm like, man, but I had enough room in front of me that I didn't panic. It's memorable though, isn't it? It's so memorable. Because you're just like, all of a sudden you're just like, oh, that doesn't, how oh, come yeah, I'm not sure. turning? I'm going to yeah. make that look better. I'm going to give it a little, and then now your ball's pegged and it's like, <laughs> and then, and you're losing some airspeed and you have the very real potential of stall spinning it into the ground. And you just, I mean, there's a couple people that lived through a stall spin, but it's not a long list, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's what, that's what Jim did. So Jim was killed in a super cub in the early seventies, Gar's best friend, and mm. Gar's the one that found him, like an accordion, stabbed in the ground, mm -hmm. and uh, it left a real mark. And so he really took me under his wing so that didn't happen. And I can think of two occasions where Gar likely saved my life. Mm -hmm. And he saved my life by telling me over and over and over. He would tell me this story and tell me that equation. As your ground speed doubles, the radius of your turn quadruples. And, he, and, and he'd always say, whenever you're going to take off up valley, which is generally a bad idea anyways. You do it kind of in a pinch and you do it mm -hmm. light always. But he says, you take off and you steer right towards the closest, you steer right towards the closest side of the valley. Yeah. And, you, and you just drive right for it and you get right up against that thing and, uh, and you've got your nose high. And then as you start this turn, um, you have yeah, maximized yeah. your radius. Or, you Wait know, till you, the wide part of the valley or something too, maybe. If you can, yeah, if yeah. the ground's not coming up too fast, yeah, mm -hmm. you want to, so you go right for the mountain and then you, and then you uh, start this turn and you stay absolutely coordinated. And what can help, even though it picks up your ground speed a little bit, is what you know, feels really good. Mike and I both kind of do this. We kind of offload our wings a little. You know, you're, if you're climb hard initially, generally speaking, you can kind of level off and kind of do like a little bit of a descending mm. turn out of it. It just feels so good because to stall that airplane with your nose pointed at the ground might be possible. I don't know how you do it. Whereas mm -hmm. if you're still climbing really hard and you're trying to make this turn, it doesn't feel as well. This doesn't feel as well. So that is a little bit of airspeed, even though yeah. airspeed increases your radius of turn, radius of turn, but it's like, but the wings not loaded. You're right. kind of, and I'm not saying dive. I'm just saying like wings. Just when of, you say the wings not loaded, 
you're equating that to being a bad thing, the wing being loaded. And I don't even know that I'm, technically I'm using the right terminology. I think I know what you mean though. Yeah, right? you're, you're just you're not that's... like, you're not like nose high, yeah. like full power climbing and turning and picking up a tailwind in a tight valley. Mm -hmm. You'd be going slow, but it's like, uh. um, I, Can I tell you about an experience I had? And Please you tell do. me, uh, coach me through it. Yeah. So I had a friend of mine, we were at, up in the secret list. There's a creek. Maybe I shouldn't tell all this, but it's a really sweet spot because there's a, a little waterfall, like, you know, that comes like off the height of this table. And there's a pool there and it's totally clear. And I'd seen it from the air and I said, Grayley, I'm going to go fish there. And so I said, on the way, we're going to stop off and go fishing. I'll be up time because I don't really care if you do. So we stop off and um, we hiked up to that spot and we fished and there was Grayley there. Awesome. It just happened to be that there yeah. was. And it was cool. Hike back, and on the way back, I'm starting to think. And I'm looking at where the creek comes in is sort of a um, gorge in the valley. Okay. And there's sort of, you know, significant rise in the valley right there. And we're walking like maybe a mile and a half back to the plane. I'm paying attention to the wind as we're going. Yeah. And I'm like, it's blowing at our backs. We're going down valley. So it's blowing down valley. And it's blowing anywhere from... 15 down to nothing, you know, but it's always down valley. It's a lot of wind though, yeah. And he is like a low time private pilot that hasn't flown in years. And so I start vocalizing my concerns. I'm like, I don't want to take off up valley. I really don't. Mainly because there's wind, I'm thinking in my head, because if I take off into this sort of rising terrain, quite significantly rising, I know I could get turned around if there was no wind. Mm -hmm. But if there's wind, I'm thinking downdrafts because of the rising mm -hmm. terrain. And then what you've just described, yeah. I'm just like, I just don't want to put myself in that situation. And I finally said, nope, I'm going to take off down, down valley. And he was like, basically not going to get in the airplane with me because he disagreed with me. He's like, you always take off into the wind. It was a real tough situation. And I ended up tying up some streamers and then just watching them. And sit, we're sitting in there for like 20 minutes. We're just sitting there watching them go straight out and then down a little bit, straight out. And then finally they kind of, and I went, and you know, and they pulled it off right at the end and went flying. But I had this whole valley of like, once I'm airborne, there's nothing else to worry about. And so that was how I was thinking through it. What is what are your thoughts based on what I've told you? Because obviously this isn't a... because this is being recorded. The honest response is that was perfect. I mean, what I was gonna when you started to tell the story, I was like, well, I definitely wanted to have a streamer on a bush that'd sit there and watch, and my engine mm -hmm. might run for twenty minutes. Mm -hmm. Like, no, that was perfect. This goes back to the like early in our conversation we we're talking about like uh, Alaska's gonna dish you something you don't love. Like yeah. that's an, were you totally comfortable with that takeoff? Mm -hmm. okay. Probably not. Yeah. Was it foolish for you to take off? I'm like, no. If, I mean, there's a point where you, if you had no idea, Daniel, if you were like, I don't know if it's going to fly or not, but I'm just going to go, that's foolish. But mm -hmm. I don't, I would yeah. guess that wasn't the scenario. That Probably you had, not, some, you no. had a pretty good idea it was going to fly. And so you're going on the best information you got. And it's just not, I think some often the modern safety culture is something that wants to boil things down to pat answers, easy yes yeah. and no's, yep. cutoffs. You know, and I can understand, in a, like when you're dealing with an industry and you have a lot of pilots and a lot of different uh, personalities, you, you gotta give them some framework. Like I can see that, so I'm reluctant. I'm not trying to rip on it too much. I just can see where that isn't how you end up being Mike Meekin with nearly 30,000 hours in the mountains in a super cup. Mm -hmm. If you were to ask Mike, how did you do it? How did you get 30,000 hours and, and have so few incidents? Yeah, He would not say, well, I never landed above my crosswind you know, cut off limit. I mm -hmm. always wore my no yeah. suit. I always wore my helmet. He just wouldn't go through a list like that. It would be all about safety is not checking boxes before you go to do that thing, putting on the proper equipment, using the safe word a lot, mm -hmm. and then getting in your machine and going and doing something that's terribly unsafe yeah. with this false pretense. Yeah. That is not safer. That's a horrible, right. you know what I mean? So a, there's a, I, yeah. I have an example of that. Because one time I was out at um, Lake George. Yeah. And flew some family out there and the wind was howling. Well, we walked to the lake. When we come back, there's a, a Cessna just totally ground looped and just destroyed oh. on the runway. He landed while we were there. 
And the guys, um, and if you're listening, I'm sorry, I don't, I, don't know, I don't know who he was, but he did say something that was profound to me. He said, I was here this morning and checked this out and it was fine. That he had checked the box. He checked, he's like, well, it went there, you know, and he, I, he, for some reason, he was just like, oh, I landed, you know, northeast, I think is the direction this morning. Yeah. And it yeah. was fine. And then he kind of got his, his visit, visiting friends and brought them and then landed northeast when there's, there's a significant south wind. It, to me, it was a really good reminder of like, you're always checking. You're sort of not like, you can't check everything off when you take off. That's true. And that, uh, is that what you're saying? Basically? That's exactly, you're, you're saying, a, that's exactly right. You just, you can't possibly have enough checklist items and safety protocols and policies and to that keep you safe. That and you that doesn't mean you shouldn't uh, have, like, let's make sure we have enough fuel before we take off. Let's make sure Absolutely. that our controls are unlocked. It's not, it's not less than all those things. It's just so much more. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's yeah. so much more than those things. Like this isn't a teaching thing, but how do you how does somebody that wants to be in the off airport world, if they can't learn it through policy, how are they gonna learn it? Well, you get out there and you turn ab gas into noise. I mean, it sounds so simple. People are like, oh, it's a cop out answer. It's like, no, really, it's proficiency. Yeah. I mean, it's like anything that takes a high level of proficiency, it's the only way forward. And in your pursuit of proficiency, Alaska is going to deal you situations that's going to allow you to grow your mm -hmm. experience and your judgment. It mm -hmm. just 100% will. You're going to end up in bad viz. You're going to end up out there do, and all of a sudden you just got to deal. So I could I could sit here and ask you 50 different ways. Yeah. Matt, how do you do it? <laughs> how? We want to be like you. We all want to be like you. How do we do it? And you're always just going to be like, dude, go practice, basically. Go fly. Go fly. And as, as a guy that does it for a living, the unfair part of that is that I get paid to go do it. Where that's guys, not unfair. It's, it's but whatever. guys like and so I always have a mission, and I um, I always have a mission, and the fact that I have a mission um, means that I'm not pursuing personal growth. I'm out there trying to get a job done. Mm -hmm. And that also enables a person to grow, right? Mm -hmm. Because yeah. you show up, you got this gold miner in the back, the wind's a lot stronger than you'd hoped. And, and so you not... start thinking, how can I make this work? And so you, so you take a recreational pilot, they end up at the same gold mine, but they don't have a paying passenger in the back. They don't have any dog in the fight and they're just gonna go home and eat nachos. Mm -hmm. And I have to make a choice. Am I so confident that I can successfully do this, that I'm gonna do it, or is it just not worth the risk mm -hmm. and I'm gonna go home and it affects this guy's life too? Through good judgment, it allows people in the profession, I think, to probably grow in their experience mm -hmm. perhaps faster. Yeah. You know, because you, I always have a reason. I'm not saying that the passenger gives you a reason to push. That's a terrible thing. I never want that on the podcast. I'm saying that, that we're, we're mission oriented. Uh, when I look at what I would consider real bush pilots like you, when I was like starting out flying, my view was that, oh, they're just so much better at me, but better than me at flying. And that's how they get into that strip or mm -hmm. that's how they founded that strip or whatever. But I've also realized as I've observed, correct me if I'm wrong, that a lot of it is just in logistical planning. Like, hmm. oh, I, yes, I'm going to land in that spot by landing over here and hiking over. Totally, totally. So I think that what you're describing with you got the miner in back is also just sort of a way, the fact that he's back there is activating to your brain. Like it activates your brain to come up with creative ways to solve a problem. Yep. And that makes you a professional. That, yeah, and you just do that for, yeah, you do that for a bunch mm -hmm. of seasons and all of a sudden you have all these life yeah. experiences and you have better judgment. Yeah. But how do you shortcut that? I don't know Well, you, you shortcut it. You've already talked about it. You shortcutted it by Falling working, in love, with, working with Mike. Falling in love with a girl whose daddy had an air taxi. Yeah. <laughs> That's well, I mean, shortcut it. Like, it's whatever. Yeah. But fi as to, to finding a spot that you want to land that you haven't landed before. Uh, yeah, just, let me. Here's some great, can I? Go ahead, yeah. It, when it comes to runways. Yeah. Gravel bars, that's one thing. Okay, is it long enough? Can I get into sure. it? Whatever. Yeah. I, I'm not as curious about that as I am some of these no-go round mm -hmm. strips that I've landed on mm -hmm. that I'm like, man, I would have loved to have seen the guy 
that saw this first and said, I think I can land there and seen his process for figuring it out. Yeah. Do you have any insight on that? It, I, I, it's that, funny. Dip, obviously, people do it different. I'm a, kind of a systematically minded person. Mm -hmm. When I'm making a new strip, I, I have an idea of a spot that I would like to touch down. And then I just like put it in slow motion. And what I mean by put it in slow, put the whole process in slow motion. I put myself in no rush and I don't care. Sometimes I'll circle. I don't want to exaggerate, but I also don't want to undercut. Like, I bet you there's times I've circled 25 times, 30 times. Mm -hmm. Because I'm just not sure and I'm trying to memorize everything from the air first. And so often you can't look at it the way that you're going to land on it. So you're looking at it going yeah, the wrong way. We're talking specifically about something that's no go round. Yes, no go round. So zone. you can't go final, oh, don't see it, go round. No, there's, yeah. So you're going to, I drag it downhill over and over. Even if it's backwards from how you're going to land on it. Yeah. So the whole site picture is different, but you're still learning where the bumps, rocks, mm -hmm. and you're picking a threshold. Mainly I'm picking a spot that I want to set my tires down. Mm -hmm. And after I think I have it, and normally it doesn't take 25 times. Normally it takes probably, I bet you it takes four or five times on average. Mm -hmm. And then I'll go out, turn final, and come in, and I'll look at it from way out on final and see if I can find that point that I had found, right? And mm -hmm. once I can, well, I'm like, okay, I for sure have that point. That is it. I still won't land that time. I'll get close and bail off the approach, mm -hmm. come back around on that flight in to see if I can see my threshold. Um, I'm a big ground speed person. I don't do airspeed, but I do check ground speed on every single landing, which I'm sure could come under judgment. But Okay, let's talk about this for a second. Yeah. Why do you like ground speed more in, in the type of flying that you do? The reason that I like ground speed more than airspeed is because I can feel the airspeed in my seat and the ground speed is the energy I have to dissipate. That is all that matters. Like when you're dealing with short distances, it's like Talk to me specifically about why in that scenario, because I feel like in some types of flying, this would never be a, an issue. I would agree because you always have ample length. You and know. you have headwind. You're always going to have a headwind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you, uh, is, so, so I have some numbers in my head for my airplane yeah. that if I can see on final, I know that I can get stopped. So I mean, on, it depends on the spot, right? It depends on the spot. But I guess I'm talking about, we have like, let's say we have between 100 and 50 and 200 runways that we use, but I've used them. And so I know they're about, they're going to be about 400 feet long plus. Mm -hmm. And generally Mike and I, if we're picking a spot, we're going to pick a spot. Like it might be only, you might only have 250 feet of good stuff, but that's plenty. If you, if you're not boxed into 250, like a 250 foot runway with cliffs on both ends is so different than a 250 foot runway where if you don't do a great job, you got to go down through this little ditch yeah. and go over a lot. You're going slow at that point. Yeah. It's like big deal, right? So yeah. I have a number in my head for my airplane that I know if I see it, I can get stopped in my 400 feet and have margin. Be totally comfortable. And, you, and you're not going to say that. You don't need to say that number, right? Because it's a different for each strip sort of. Yeah. Or? And if I said it, everybody, this would be a funny thing because people would be so shocked at how high it is. Well, okay. Well, why if, don't you say a number? Because for me and my Super Cub, it's anything in the 50s. Anything in the 50s. Anything in the 50s I know is no problem loaded in 400 feet. So yeah, my Super Cub, just for anybody that is, that's interested, it weighs, you know, classic, about 1,250 pounds. It's just a working Super Cub. There's mm -hmm. nothing special yeah. about it. It doesn't even have VGs. I don't have VGs. It's like a Super Cub with a 160 horse engine. What? I know. What? <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> so I don't have an extended flap. I don't have the, I mean, I would yeah. love to have a set of those cool flaps. I just, I mean, they're 10,000 bucks. It's like, are they going to make me $10,000? I mean, I'm, I'm, yeah, whatever. All right, let's go back to this. We're, we're finding a strip. We found a spot. Yeah. And we're circling 20, 25 to 40 times. Right. <laughs> 600 times you circling. <laughs> just circling out. You know, finally you run out of fuel and just go in. <laughs> no, so you circle there six times and you're, you're coming in and you're bailing off and then you're looking at your ground speed on the next route and you're coming in and you're landing. Yeah. Anything in between there that I'm missing? No, that's, you, that's really good. That's really good. The, so the key, the key factors are... Obviously, is it long enough? We're looking at, generally, you're talking about long enough. Yeah. Is it smooth enough? Where am I going to put my tires on the ground? Mm -hmm. And how fast am I on final? I will not go into a new spot without, like, doing a ground speed check on final. Like, I go out there, I'm full flaps, 
and I'm on final, and I'm not like, I'm not saying short final. These are one-way strips. I'm so way out So you're way there. out. You're approaching your ditch point. Right. But you know the wind, and the wind can be so different out there than it is right yeah. at the runway. And that is an unknown factor. You can, in that last few hundred yards, get some real nasty surprises, especially if it's really steep terrain because of the upslope wind. So you could be out here real high on final with a really beautiful ground speed mm -hmm. you're like all pumped about. And that last little bit, right when you get committed, you can just feel the airplane sag like crazy. It picks up this big old tailwind. You come in with a ton of power. Your ground speed starts. But it's a bad. It's always a bad feeling. That's when it's nice. Um, and it, and, and I, uh, similarly to when you're doing a downwind turn, mm -hmm. a downwind flare can be even scary. I mean, really scary too, right? It just involves a lot of power. Well, yeah. You, you so touch you, down with full power. I mean, it's just like... <laughs> <laughs> You're, like it does, it, we definitely do that, but it's not, it's generally so steep, the length isn't an yeah. issue. And See, it, I feel yeah. like that's a great example as well of what you're talking about of judgment yeah. because you would never go full power as you flare. Right. Yeah. But it seems like I remember I had to do it once and I was like, what in the fuck am I doing? Sorry, I should have. <laughs> But I bet, like, why am I going full power? There's something wrong here. And, and I, so I went like half power and it wasn't working for, you know, it was just very quickly happening. Yes. And then I was like, I, I, I think I need to go more power. And it was so far beyond what I was taught to do that I almost didn't do it. I mean, I almost pancaked in, I think. I totally, you can pancake in in that scenario. And it's interesting to me that even though, and that's exactly what I mean by the, the seat of your pants. It's like you're... Your, your butt is telling you, I have to be adding more power, even though it feels so wrong mm -hmm. because I'm on short final and you just don't stop. Yeah, just wah. Yeah. And an another thing about the approach, if this is where you're gonna land, look at that, that's like, that's like a 90 degree angle. You're approaching the that's ground. That's what I mean about the flare. That so, flare looks crazy to me. Is that where the, this is dangerous and just acknowledging it comes in? Because you're, you're like, okay, that's dangerous. I'm never gonna take that out of it, but how? What's safer? Yeah, right. No, that's just it. You're not. You're not. You're not like trying to do a safe maneuver. You're trying to make it as safe as possible. Like, mm -hmm. what's the definition of safe? No, yeah. Oh, it, it, okay. it is. Let's, it let's, is to. Um, here's yes. the definition of safe. This is the definition. Uh, protect from or not exposed to danger or risk. Okay, so you can't fly an airplane then. Done. Well, you definitely can't fly an airplane in the mountains and land on upslope you, thing, you no know, go around ridges, winds. There's a video, I wish we could find it, of Mike uh, landing on an uphill strip. And mm -hmm. I, I don't understand it because I'm, I'm watching it and I'm going, well, he disappeared behind this ridge. You know? mm -hmm. And he's coming along and you can see him disappear below oh, yeah. the thing and you can hear him and you're like, where is he? And you, wah, 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 and, and then he comes boop, up over here. <laughs> like you're like he's not even he went all down over here. And I'm just imagining what's going on in an approach like that. And yeah. this, I mean, he obviously lands coming up over the hill, and then he kind of pops up over the top, and he stopped. On that strip, the hardest mm -hmm. thing about that is the steep uphill part where Mike's disappeared. Okay, he comes up over the ground like you, or up over the knob like you described, but that's a very short distance. And you have some speed when you come over the knoll and it's like a, it's like this landscape gets revealed to you and there's rocks out there you can't hit. Mm. So it's really funny. We actually, we named that one Dodger because, <laughs> because it's like you're always halfway through your ground roll and, you're, and, 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 and then you get to see the rest of the strip and you're like, ooh, ooh. Oh, yeah, okay, we're <laughs> golden. <laughs> well, and so I was taking off similar where you're like, okay, got to get the cub pointed in the right way and then sort of, or do you have like some markers out there to aim at like, that's kind of a Between funny one. here and there. It's kind of, it's all kind of janky, like the, just the shape of it. Mm -hmm. And so we generally land on that low end and we take off on a different kind of, they don't, we don't share the same real estate mm -hmm. for takeoff and landing, but it's all the same runway, mm. if that makes any sense. It doesn't like kind go of, over yeah. the hump. Yeah. It's kind of. Well, but, but I mean, are you, when you're, when you're taking off down something where you can't see your whole runway, Oof, I don't how know. do you get the directional, uh, how do you get going in the right direction? It's such a great question, Daniel, because that is, I mean, it's a problem. It's a problem because your tail's on the ground, you got these big old 35s, you, mm -hmm. you just can't see over the nose. And so a lot of it, you, I take markers down the side. Mm -hmm. Like I know before takeoff, like I will stop. I generally, 
you know, don't just line up with the runway for takeoff. I taxi out onto the runway and look out the side window and kind of get a couple visual markers. Mm -hmm. And then you turn 90 and line mm -hmm. up and you go and you just needed enough visual markers to get to where you could get your tail up, mm -hmm. right? And then once you got your tail up, you can see where the heck you're going. But Can we look at some photos? Yeah. And then we're going to go through and I want you to talk about some other stuff you're doing that's sure. like insanely cool. Is that for a sauna? So that's the sauna. So yeah, so mm -hmm. that's gonna, so the, I haven't actually flown it yet. That was a test run in the hangar. It is very easy to load on the side of the airplane like that in that configuration and it flies fine. This is so cool though. <laughs> <laughs> so the one thing I'm asking, is a reason you put it on the right side? In this case, no, but I was falling into how I hauled the snow machine and it was on the right. And I did put thought into it on the right. And it's because of the slipstream. I think mm -hmm. the slipstream would be on the other side of the airplane mm -hmm. more. Okay. So anyway, this is pretty cool. And this is part of a project you're working on. Yeah. That will be done at some point. It'll be done. I got bookings for August. Wow. No, so we're booked. We're, 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 it'll open up for selective booking for some friends and stuff through July and then into and then August and September, it's going to be open to the public. All right, next. Okay, here's another lumber. Yeah. Those fly great. You don't even know they're down there. Yeah, it's almost like a wing. Is that, is that like kind of like a wing itself? I, I don't know that you gain lift, but you just can't tell it's down there. It flies great. I That's the uh, question I had about the stove. That doesn't mm -hmm. uh, screw up your, your uh, elevator at all? Yeah, you'll feel it. It really depends. The thing I don't like about the stove is the flat face. The, the, anytime you got a yeah. flat face, it's the worst. So I will feel that. But when I do feel it, I just fly with a little bit of flap. And the flat, the air then, the flap deflects the air uh, underneath the tail. Hmm. And it generally will get rid of all that vibration. Just one click. So that's a slow flight, but it's only... Do you have enough experience that you kind of can think, oh, I know how this is going to fly? I hmm. guard myself against that. I would... I definitely you have an idea of what it's going to be like, but you, I try not to be too confident. Okay. Yeah. All right. What I try you? not to be, yeah. You know okay, so this is... Uh, that's the hut. That's the hut, and it's pretty much done there. I mean, it looks done. Yeah. Is that the bathroom? Is that the sauna? What? That, there it is. That's, uh, it, that, that little building is the... We're looking at the outhouse door, and, the, and that's half of it, and then the other half is the generator shed. So it'll be fully... Um, is that a sauna? Did you get a sauna up there? You yeah, so the stove is for the sauna, and the sauna is uh, is actually attached to the main structure there. It's the oh. lower room. It's the, other, it's the little building, or the little room attached. Yep. Yeah, so it'll have a shower inside, running hot and cold running water, full kitchen, king bed, couple leather recliners, a sleeping loft. Did you say running water? Running hot, yeah, hot and cold, yep. How are you, do you want to talk about how you're doing that out there? You know, I'm going to have to pump water up from the glacier. Water's a problem. And how are you getting power? Generator? Generator, a super capacitor. You ever heard of a super capacitor? Mm -hmm. It's a, uh, so you've got a super capacitor from super capacitor energy. And so it's not a battery bank. It's actually only weighs 92 pounds, but it's five and a half kilowatts of power. Mm -hmm. And it's not a lithium ion battery. It's a super capacitor, which is so that's pretty sweet. So my generator is going to, through an inverter, charge a supercapacitor. The supercapacitor is going to deliver power. And um, Will it sort of be like where a guest could come and they just sort of flip a switch on the whole thing? sort of? Totally. Like I will have it totally prepped, the bulk water for them stored. The, everything will be completely cleaned, ready to go. They show up and it's going to be just like a vacation rental. You're going to drop people off up there. You're going to be... I'm going to go in the day before, completely prep it, fill the water tank, get the heat on. Make sure everything's functional. Put the avocados on the counter. Right. Put the <laughs> avocados, the bottle of wine on the counter. Go home, spend the night, get up in the morning, haul them out. And then they just have the hut. If I'm not available or if the weather's bad or if the guest requests it, we also, I'm working with Mark at Sheet Mountain Lodge and he'll take the helicopter oh, in there. There you go. I love this because it's totally crazy. You know what I mean? I feel like there's certain things it's like, well, why has no one done this? And people have done this. Totally. Right? Totally. You're not the first person to mm -hmm. do this, but there are risks that you're taking, probably pretty big risks, but the upside could be huge. And I love that because it's cool. like, good on you. Thank you for doing that. Like, to me, it's just like, it's entertaining. It's inspiring. It's really, really cool. It's educational. It's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be really fun if people, yeah, to have a place to, to, to get off the beaten path and go do something mm -hmm. a little different. 
difficult. All right, what do we got for pictures? There you are building it. And that's how, my, okay, what did you not haul in with your super? There's power? a great big steel I-beam that my brother flew in with the A-Star. The four by eight sheets of black iron. Yeah, the siding or? Yeah, yeah, the steel at the bottom. I had that helicoptered in because that was really heavy and. Are awkward. you talking about the siding or the? I flew all the siding in, like okay. that. Yeah, all the all the normal siding, but this stuff here I had helicopter. Oh, that's in. iron. Yeah. yeah, that's that's like, um, that's just like eighth inch, just black iron, just steel, just why why is, gonna why is that what you used? I just you like just the way like, it looked. Like the way it looked, yeah. so you're like, well, might as yeah. well haul this in. And then just under, too heavy. Is it? It was just too heavy, huh? It was. Just awkward. You can imagine a great big flat sheet. Like the, the metal siding has ribs, mm -hmm. right? It's pretty rigid. Mm -hmm. And it was all banded up and stuff. Mm -hmm. The black iron was just kind of loose. Mm -hmm. And there's some couple times I just got into some time time constraint issues and just mm -hmm. needed it moved. There's also underneath the hut, there's gonna be water storage inside the hut for the users during their stay. Yeah. But underneath the hut, there's also 1,100 gallons of storage. And so those are big water tanks and those had to be helicoptered in. Mm -hmm. I helicoptered in most of the insulation, just because it would have been so many airplane loads. It's so bulky. It was still, I think, two or three helicopter loads. Because mm. I insulated the floor, it's, you know, it's got in-floor heat. Mm. So the floors are all insulated, the walls, roof, it just, yeah. It, the whole project, it turned into quite a project. How many I, years have you been working on this? Started in 2019. Nothing Isn't happens crazy. <laughs> what is it, it was just crazy how much work most people go, oh, okay. Just, it's like, no, have you ever thought about how you've got to bring in all the infrastructure? I mean, when I look at, go up in Hatcher Pass and look at some of those buildings that are Incredible. way up in the side of the mountain and you're like, or a cable stretch across the valley. Amazing. And it's like, man, somebody worked. I want to know all those little details because it's those little details that planning, the, the, um, the logistics that I was saying earlier, like this is what a bush pilot, this is, it's also what makes you a bush pilot is, Figuring out the logistics. Yeah, it is. It's not just stick and rudder, you know? Yeah. <laughs> this oh, is, man. yeah, this is like, you, you. I figure if you built something like this remote, then you can be called a bush pilot. <laughs> <laughs> because of all the logistical planning that went into well, the Well, I mean, just the, I mean, if you did the flying to do it and everything, and I mean, you, can, I think that would be a qualifier. Yeah, it is funny how many things have been flown in in Alaska in the bush. You know, yeah, I mean, uh, just all, yeah. yeah, forever. And someone think, figured it out. Maybe they yeah. never ha had someone do it. Yep. A lot of the stuff on this, you probably figured it out yourself or maybe uh, and then you build some old timers and yep. stuff. And step on the shoulders of the generation before yeah. us, right? You see what mm -hmm. the old timers did and yeah. Okay, so now we're to the fun part. So I had a, a Sorensen belly tank was something that used in the agricultural world for airplanes to put belly tanks on and be able to spray, agricultural mm -hmm. spray. They have a quick release mechanism because those airplanes needed an emergency release in case they ever had a mechanical or something like that. So they would just drop the tank. They could basically. drop the entire tank. They could pull a lever inside and the whole tank would fall off. So I took one of those quick release mechanisms from a Cessna 185 and then remounted it and stuff and put it on the Super Cub and changed rather than straps, made chains. And, and then that there's a lever inside the cockpit and I can lift a lever and it releases, it releases the um, external load I, of course, didn't drop my plywood. I didn't drop my windows. I didn't, there's a lot I didn't drop. So why did you drop instead of just landing? Just, it, I thought it'd be faster. I mean, okay, so the practical reasons are it was, it was much faster. Right, because you don't, you don't have to unload it. Yeah, it was very close to the hut rather than being down at the bottom. And I didn't know if my little tundra was going to be able to pull all the wood up. So you would have had been like two two by sixes at a time. No, <laughs> It's like, take forever. <laughs> my tundra can pull up half of what my Super Cub flies in, generally mm. speaking. So it takes me twice as many snow machine loads. How many drop does. loads did you do? I don't know, but it was a lot. I oh, dropped yeah, the I mean, there's one video where it's just show, it's just peppered with, <laughs> it's we, uh, like, yeah, we, this uh, is, this, I love your, the look on your face. You're, you think you're so cool. You think you're so cool, dude. And then the, the one where it shows the plume and then it cuts to you and be like, yeah, I'm so cool. <laughs> Such a nerd. And sometimes I do think I did it just so I could drop things. I was serious. It was so fun to think through it. It was like one of the first ideas I had with the hut. I was like, I'm going to airdrop. But it's so silly. <laughs> so yep. I, when I watch this, I'm like, oh, it makes it so, so fun. It makes it so fun to watch. Because it's like, it. not only is it so freaking cool, 
But it's but but then to watch you enjoy it in the way that I feel like I would enjoy it if it was me. Well, you know any, what I mean? Anybody thinks it would be fun to pull a lever and drop something, right? Yeah, I look mean, at like, you. Look at look at you. Yeah. <laughs> and then it, oh my. <laughs> Oh, so nerdy. <laughs> and then you look over to the side like you knew you could see the plume, you know? <laughs> Everyone needs to go to your channel. This is another thing that's incredible. Yeah. It's that... certainly not the first one to haul a, a snow machine on oh, of the course Super not. God, but it was, a, yeah, that was a fun. I think I did it different here. I think guys normally put the engine forward. I mm -hmm. just, on wheel skis, you're already, your center of gravity is pretty far forward. Yeah. Weight and balance on that. How do you find the center of the snow machine? Yeah. Did you, no. did you go through that or did you just lift your tail method? No, I had to find, you have to get an idea of where it balances and figure out, because you know, if you take a really long, like a long mm -hmm. object and it balances right here, that is where that weight is felt. It doesn't oh. matter if you, like say you have a, a, a 16 foot board and you attach it to the tail wheel only and you have it cantilevered forward, right? Mm -hmm. Even though all the weight is bending down on your tail wheel, that object is going through the air with your airplane in the center of gravity. It's felt in the middle okay. of that board. Wherever the middle of that board I've falls I've always on wondered airplane. about that. I didn't know that. And I yeah. had to call, I called an aeronautical engineer to confirm that. Because that made sense to my mind, but I mm -hmm. didn't know that it was true. So I, I had to check on that. Yeah. And so then how did you balance it, figure out where the center of it? Did you do that? You just kind of, yeah, you just balance. You just get a board and kind of figure out where it balances. Okay. Yeah, and then you kind of are, have a rough idea of where that's going to fall in the cockpit, and then you can get yeah. your arm. Interesting, yeah. very interesting. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I love this. You, okay, no big deal. All right, there's a snow machine there. <laughs> <laughs> the wheel uh, skis is, I mean, that's, I, so if I, that's the, another thing I admired about you when I saw this is, if I was doing this, I would have borrowed a set of straight skis for this, you know. <sighs> but it, maybe it helped having the, it resting on the, the tire. It's just because at the time that I did it all, now we have a house up there at Sheep Mountain, mm -hmm. but I didn't have a house. So mm -hmm. I had to go back to Wasilla every night because I And so you family. had to have wheel skis on so you could land. Yeah, because I got a dirt runway. So I was like, well, I guess I'll just do this yeah. on wheel skis. We'll figure it out. Mm. So, yeah. Okay, this is, when I saw this, I laughed so hard. I don't know why. I was just like, okay, whatever, bro. <laughs> that's Shut totally, up. that's totally, what do you call that? That's a... Uh, a camera angle situation? No, like, uh, what are you trying a to flex? No, there you go. That's exactly, that's a Were total Were you trying to flex, flex when you posted this? I was this? totally flexing with this picture. Do, did you, where in the hell did you land here? Did you land, I'm thinking you're kind of pointed almost down the runway. There. Totally. Yeah. I landed up, I, that's where I turned around, just take it off back downhill. But it was, it actually, I mean, in all honesty, it's a nasty spot. This is the only day I've ever landed there in my life. I've never been back. So to make it look like that with the giant glacier in the back, oh, it was gnarly. It has to look way more gnarly, like in in person, if you're taking it with an iPhone. You're not wrong. That so, is a gnarly spot. So that's spot. the thing about yeah. that photo: is it looks really gnarly, and it it is more gnarly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, I love that photo. That's and there's another one in here that I chose for. That is awesome. I, I want you to talk about this. What's going on here, and what happened? Uh, Mike landed. I think they're doing some work with the uh, on some sheep or something like that, and he sat down. To something about some a helicopter, gas. you said in the uh, in the description. Yeah. Uh, so he was dropping think, off fuel for a helicopter or something. Yes, yes. Okay. And I think that he got a little stuck in the, the for, and you don't do stuff like this. You don't just plop down out in the middle of Horse Pasture Pass in the middle mm -hmm. of January with that much snow, just, unless you have a helicopter standing by with three other you know able-bodied men and mm -hmm. women. Because so what did they do? Did they lift him up or, and stuff? Or did no, he just, no, no. He, he just, just stomped it out, and they might have. I think he was stuck, couldn't move. They came down, pushed on his wings, got him up to where he was sitting on some solid mm -hmm. ground. And uh, at he that probably, point, he is still under, right? He's definitely, he's definitely, he's buried. Yeah, the skis are buried. It's amazing to me because I've flown with Mike a lot, but I've flown with him more on wheels than on skis. And when we get in ski situations together, he, he never sees. He has so much knowledge in that realm from working mm -hmm. the glaciers for so many years is, is awesome. Okay, next uh, next photo here. Okay, this one made me laugh because I was like, come on, where's the freaking runway? That's a funny picture. Is that I, the runway? Are we looking down is, the runway? That was the one smooth spot. They That's normally not a we landed. Spot. Well, we normally we landed up here, but it was way off to the side. Anyways, this was the one flat spot we could land on. It was only because the wind was probably blowing 20 or something. So you could kind of go in there and like, dunk, dunk, right? And stop. 
and then take off going up Glacier. Okay, so those people, you had staged them somewhere else. They had hiked in, and we are just bringing them food. Oh. That's Knowles. Okay. National Outdoor League. I thought you dropped them all off one at a time, landing there. Oh, no. no. <laughs> I was that like, is that funny. is pretty serious. <laughs> <laughs> no, just one time in, drop off all the groceries. Uh -huh. I might have made a couple trips, because they probably had climbing gear or something. I'm not sure, but it, very few landings. Yeah. Uh -huh. I like how humble you are about it. You didn't weren't like, oh, it's nuts, you know. I almost bent my cove up on that one. I'm just like, oh, no big deal. It's just in the photo, just the angles. I love that. Is that it? That's it. Okay, so um, something I was going to tell you about um, with this is you talk about the difficulty in articulating. Or are we mentioning everything? Are we remembering all the angles to communicate an issue mm. that could be a safety issue, right? If someone takes this as more than entertainment, which is just entertainment. Right. But I think my strategy for that is going to be to do a second episode. Some of those, these things we talked about today, as we listen to it and go, oh man, we should have mentioned, we should have done this. We can totally. come back and do another episode. And so for comments, for the, 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 um, the people watching, comment and say, hey, I have a question about this or that, because we'll read it and then in a future episode, we'll address it. We released our first episode a couple weeks ago, and we have a couple clips from that that were taken out of context that have gotten like almost 800,000 views now. Oh! And um, a lot of comments and some very negative comments. Uh, well, this guy's an idiot, you know? And, and, and citing some reasons because they're taking something completely out of context. Right. Which they have no choice. It's a reel right. posted up on Instagram. Like, what are they gonna do, right? And how are we gonna communicate that in 30 seconds or whatever? I remember, here's a funny thing that's easy, great to take out of context, then I think was uh, hinted at by, uh, who, it was hinted at by Steve Williams, but um, I think I heard him say this, and I heard my father-in-law say this when I was fresh out of flight school, and I'm up here in Alaska, and Mike looks at me and he's like, don't get in the habit of doing any of those go-arounds, they'll kill you." Okay. So he's saying like exactly opposite of what all the flight schools teach you. Like it's all about go around. If you don't like the way it's set up, all this stuff. And then you got the boss saying like, and at the time I thought he was crazy. I can tell you after 20 years of flying in the bush, he's absolutely right. You want to die just getting the habit of thinking you gotten out. No, man, you, you do your evaluation of the situation and then you set up and you land that airplane and you keep the wreckage. If there's going to be a wreck, you keep it right there on that runway. You don't leave it. You don't put it 900 yards up the side of the mountain over there because mm -hmm. that's how you die. Like that's, does that make sense? I totally agree with it. And I get, because I've dipped my toes in this kind of flying that you do. That's the kind of flying I've always wanted to do. You know, yeah. I want to be in the mountains. I love being in the mountains. Yeah. I love being on top of the mountain. And I want to do as little hiking as possible. Yeah. <laughs> and that is such a scary thing to me of the no-go-round situation. Right. And the first video that any, when I first got my license, a friend of mine sent me this video, said, you have to watch this. It was about a guy, he was landing on a mountain strip, and it was a no-go-round strip. They had talked about it, and they were like weekend warriors, and he was uh, coming in, and it didn't look right, and he went around. And his buddies are standing on the ground, and they said, oh, crap. And they just knew what was going to happen because there's no way this could end right. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And he ended up, he survived, but there was an interview with those guys. It's on YouTube. But I think um, that is something that can be taken out of context. And it's to, to talk about what you just said, we're talking about in the context of mountain <laughs> flying when you're landing exactly. in mountains. There are a lot of situations. There are certain runways, one-way runways in the mountains where I go around. It's a... It's yeah. going to kill you. And so right. there needs to be a mental, there needs to be a mental line on final at some point where I tell myself at, from here forward, I'm going to leave the wreckage on the runway. Mm -hmm. I, I seriously will tell yeah. myself that. I, like, it, that okay, too. if things don't go well, it doesn't matter. I'm going to land on that spot and then whatever happens, happens. But we're I not. I always say, I'm yeah. landing. Right. <laughs> I'm landing. I'm landing. <laughs> um, with, with that, I would say you can apply that saying you can always go around to those runways prior to the point of no return. Yeah. And I, I like that idea. Yeah. And that's what I need to do more of, I think. But correct me if I'm wrong. Because when you're approaching that, that ditch point, I think a ditch point is better. It's not even Steve a go Steve Williams said yeah. you go downhill, right? Yeah, totally. You always go downhill or whatever. But um, 
when you're approaching that point, you can go around as many times as you want prior to that. Yeah, totally. So, a ditch point is a great way. And just going back to this is back and way up in the conversation, but in terms of flying in the mountains, another great rule of thumb is always be able to point your nose towards lowering terrain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, I mean, it sounds, I remember the first time I heard that, I was like, duh. But no, really. When the first time you're flying along and, and you're mm -hmm. thinking to myself, right now, if, if the unspeakable happened, let's say, and I had an engine failure, no matter what I do, I have to turn 180 degrees or more to get to where I ha have terrain that's so sketch. And you can feel it. Your spider senses should be tingling. If you're coming into a zone where you're below this terrain and you have to make a significant turn to get to where you're headed back downhill, that's just a bad place to be. You should be approaching stuff like that. And you know, you should, I try to, like, you just always want an out that you can see out your side window. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't have to go like this <laughs> to see your out. So you know? would you say, that what I'm hearing from you, to, to put this in simple terms, yeah. we got the no go around, just <gasps> the flabbergasting statement of that'll kill you. You know, the, the go arounds will kill you, yeah. all that stuff. If you don't understand that and you don't understand the context of that, you probably shouldn't be in the mountains, right? right? <laughs> That's fair. You shouldn't be landing in the mountains anyways. Right. On, on that topic, yeah. 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 There's places that you're gonna put your airplane that um, you cannot successfully uh, get out of without landing. Mm -hmm. Hey, I got a story. Can I tell a story? This yeah. is too late in this no. thing. No, tell a story. Here's a story where experience bit me in the butt that I was looking for a spot to land on a glacier. So you're on the ice. What, you mean, you say experience bit you in the butt? Yeah, my experience is the thing that hosed me. Okay. So um, it's a glacier, it's ice, so I'm on tires. I've landed here in years past. We're coming into hunting season. I'm scoping that year's landing spot on the ice. Mm -hmm. I find the zone, I drag it going downhill. I drag it again. I'm looking like all the things I talked about earlier. And on a glacier, the air always flows down glacier because it's cold, dense air, mm -hmm. right? So it's just gonna be going down the slope. And so when I'm dragging it going downhill, I've got a tailwind. And then when you're gonna turn around and land, you're gonna land with that headwind going, mm -hmm. okay. So I come around and I'm gonna land on this one-way strip on the ice with the wind on my nose. And I come in here and then I realize the wind's not on my nose. The air doesn't always move down glacier. That's where the experience, right? You just got this assumption, oh, there's glacier, mm. the air's gonna be going downhill. It just wasn't keyed up, was complacent. It done this so much, it didn't matter. Like I'm sure mm. the air's going down, so you wow. just make an assumption. And then I get on final approach and you realize I was, uh, Oh, I know what it was. I wasn't going to land. I was making my low pass. I was just picking my touchdown point. Oh, and that's what it was. I was picking my touchdown mm -hmm. point. Not, and, and, uh, and so I tried to make the turn and I just initiated the turn and was like, ooh, that does not feel good. And so I quick leveled my wings. And by this time, the runway's behind me. And then it's just like, you got nothing but ice in front of you. And I just chopped the power and landed on the ice. And you're like, and everything was fine. I was way beyond. I was a, I was See, I was like, hundreds of yards beyond the airstrip in a spot I had not looked at at all. And by the grace of God, yeah. didn't hit anything. Didn't, there's no crevices, no moulins, no holes or anything like that. But I mean, it's one of those times where when you turn around to take off, your heels are shaking, you know, and you're like, that was not good. <laughs> 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 it's, it's so bad. It's, it's very bad. interestingly, though, you did the right thing, it sounds like. If just I'm just gonna land. Yeah, right. It's like oh, oh, snap decision. This I, this feels bad. And you knew it felt so. It was yeah. your experience that both was biting you in the butt while it was picking you up, essentially, that's, and that's helping you. Because it was. I mean, yeah. like a lot of people would have been like, "Oh, full power. Let's try to climb this. Let's do whatever." And just because you're just all of a sudden in unknown zone. Right. right. Very interesting that that you would know the second you turned. Oh, I got a tailwind. Yeah. It just feels wrong. And I just, what so, was so disappointing to me was just that huge assumption and the complacency to not really be checking all the factors. Not looking at ground speed, obviously, just not doing my due yeah. diligence. So much of bush flying, and this is a funny thing, this is such a huge part of it that, we, that doesn't get talked about very often, mm -hmm. but everybody knows it the second you say it, is recognizing where you're gonna put your tires. Totally. I mean, everybody's lost their strip on final. And I, over time, you learn to not panic about it. You yeah. learn to like be like, well, I know the closer, I know it's going to come into view, mm -hmm. but man, I, there's been a 
hundreds of landings where you're on, you're getting to where you're on short final and your eyes are still just like looking for that rock. It's like, oh, there it is. Mm -hmm. Or that tire track or whatever you're, you're mm -hmm. you know, but wherever you're going to put your tire on the ground, like that point, that point of where you're going to put your tire on the ground is huge. With a no go round strip, before you get to, let's call it your ditch point, yeah. the point where you can turn around, let's say it's a, a, a half a mile away from your touchdown point. So do you have a couple of points? It's like, okay, I can see the little rock that looks like, you know, a, a penis or something. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking for one landmark. I mean, one it could landmark. be discolored they, grass. It could be a rock. It could be a... Just so that you know, okay, that's... And so you're... Until you find that, like, I, I did one this last summer and I was like, it was a little scary because it was quite a ways out that I need to make a decision. Yeah. And I and I never landed there, but it's a really easy one, you know. But I was like, I gotta have that that little um, squirrel mound, yes. you know, that the the little marmot hole. I could see it from like way out, and I saw it. I flew over, saw it, and then I looked back and kept looking back. Yep, I can still see it from here. Okay, this is my ditch point. I can still see it. And so when I got there the first time. I couldn't, I didn't, I was like, where is it? I can't find it. And so I ditched and it came around again until I found it. But that's beautiful. Do you have like, if something's so far away, do you have like multiple ones ever or? I, I generally just fix it. I'm just looking for my point. Yeah. You, but I just will not continue that approach until you know that the spot that you need yeah. to, uh, that you have that in your sights because hmm. it is so uncomfortable to not land on runways. I mean, like to think you're landing on the runway and then, and I mean, we've all done it. And then yeah. you land and you're like, I'm not even on the runway. You say we've all done that. I've never done that. Haven't you? <laughs> no, I've never done that. Well, neither have I. <laughs> well, I mean, I think that shows how uh, um, inexperienced I am no. that I have. When you say we've all done it, you <laughs> it's not something we brag My, about. The runways I land on generally are a little more visible, I think, <laughs> than the ones you land on. Uh, oh, okay, so then the other thing. I wanted to tell you publicly, because I've done seat upholstery since I was 17, and I was around aviation. When I was on Lake Hood as a kid, I was watching people flying Super Cubs. And I mean, back then, I think there were, you know, like a, a nice one was like 180,000, like a really nice yeah, one. Yeah, right. Know? And, but you know, a, a crappy one was 60,000. But that was so far beyond what I could afford at the time. And so I, I think I just never really opened my mind to flying a Super Cub. And my brother had a Cessna 150 and I flew that a little bit. I had some hours in that and it never clicked for me, even though I was around aviation all this time, until we were doing that video. <laughs> and I basically, as in all intents and purposes, I paid you to take me flying. Totally. Yeah. We did a great trade. It was yeah. awesome. Still using so, the seats today. So you took me right out of here, came pick me up, Jumped in the back, wheel skis, zipped right up there by Hatcher Pass. And in, I mean, you really did a, let me say this, you didn't burn much fuel. <laughs> <laughs> and you landed a, us on a glacier. And we were turning this, what I felt like was a tight little bowl, which you were like, no, this is well within the realms. And I was just like, this is so cool. And there was hmm. something about the way you flew it, and just I just love Super Cubs. I love the way they fly. I love everything about them. And it, it was the first time I'd been in a Super Cub. Hmm. And it made me want to get my own airplane and finish getting my pilot's license more than anything that had ever happened. That's awesome. And that, that experience, we were up there, and I just kept, I kept saying to myself, we're days of walking. We're day, we'd have to walk for days and it took us 15 minutes to get here. You know, it was like, and then I was like, man, he could have spent a little more fuel and take you know? <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm kidding about that. <laughs> I mean, I did think about that. I was like, man, he really, this was easy for him. <laughs> I was like, this is cool. And leave it, leave it to the air taxi guys. Yeah, you're just like, like, what's the coolest, what's the quickest snap, 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 we can do this and get this trade done. No, but it was so cool. And, the, and we sat there and talked for, I don't know, an hour or something. But you told me a few things and one, it really inspired me to get my pilot's license. And at the time I was dating Nicole and you said, hey man, when the heck are you gonna get married? Like, what's your problem essentially? And um, 
dude, within like, I don't know if it was maybe a year or two years of that, it's like my whole life came together that had been just sitting on hold for since I was 17, That's right? That's funny. It's like I just needed someone a little outside of it to sort of kick me into place, right? And you did that for me. I got I got an air I got married. That was the first part of your advice that I did. And and I didn't necessarily do it because oh Matt said of I should get married. Not. No. But it was a huge part of it. It was like, oh, he's a really cool guy. And he said that this is something cool to do that I'm really scared to do. And I got married. And then as soon as I got married, I, I turned to Nicole and I said, you know, I want to get an airplane. And she was like, I love that idea. And it was, but it was all like with, with that. You and there's another, one other person that really just kicked me into it. And That's I don't, funny. the crazy thing about it is, and it's encouraging to me, I don't really think you thought this even one second about it. Not even, no, and that's one of those scenarios, right, where someone's like primed to do something and you just happen to be the person that has the message and you don't even know. Yeah, you, yeah. And it, it, it's not even, yeah, it's nothing. So it meant a lot to where me, you, were you probably don't life. even remember it. It's where, just where you were at in your life. Yeah. But it's fun when God uses, you know, to, yeah, yeah, to yeah. use a little bit of advice. And it's like, I, I love somebody, it. And I, yeah. that's what I say is like, man, <clears throat> what, a, what a gift to be able to give something to someone that's so valuable, but it's free to you. Hmm. And, hmm. and that's what you did. So I want to tell you that. And then... Um, the th I, and then I had two questions for you. What does it mean to you to be to have that ability to take someone into the backcountry, into the wilderness that otherwise wouldn't be able to get there? Yeah, because that's something that's really important to you. Super important to me, and at times it definitely fades because you are so fat focused on the on the on the job at hand. And it becomes a matter of discipline trying to remind yourself that this person, this is something they've been looking forward to all year or maybe for their entire life, mm -hmm. right? And then you finally, they get to get in a plane and go on. A, and so to try to just remember that and not take the shortest route always. I'm serious. It's a, it's a real thing because we're mm -hmm. like, you're in it all day. You're just like, rah, 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 like doing, you mm -hmm. know, when you're just air taxiing around. Yeah. And so, to, and so um, but when you can, when I can get my head right and you remember that, it's about the person's experience that's sitting in the back seat, mm -hmm. and then, and you know that this is something that they've never seen and may never get to see again. And it's how hard, it's mind... hard to imagine put yourself in their shoes. Isn't yeah, it? yeah, and it's just like the the, the the scenery, like the real estate up here that God made is mm -hmm. is mind blowing. People always say, "Oh, Matt, you're a great photographer," and this is not false humility; it's just a fact. I'm like. No, you don't get it. Like, yeah. <laughs> you can take the camera and go out any window at almost any time, and people yeah. are going to say that's a great picture. Yeah. Um, it's just a fantastic place to fly. And so it's super duper. I love being able to share that with people. That mm -hmm. is the, the spirit behind building the, the Glacier Hut. That isn't a promo. That's just the fact. It's like, I want people to be able to go out into that wilderness that we get to see all the time because mm -hmm. it's in our front yard. And let somebody not only see it, but get out of the plane, be utterly comfortable, and just soak in that for like 48 hours. Mm -hmm. It's, it's life-changing. Like yeah, 48 like it. hours. I love that. I love them being able to do that for a, in a very comfortable way. Yeah. Have a sauna and a wood stove and a yep. whatever you're going to And just sit there know. and listen to the birds and look at the view and think about life. Mm -hmm. Like that is the, that's the goal for the spot. So... so do you have uh, any stories of where you really were, were like smacked in the face with this of like, oh, wow, this is really special for this person and the way they responded to it or something, something that really stuck with you? I remember this guy. I don't know why. It's funny. This one comes to mind. We take off and a lot of people are real nervous about flying. Mm -hmm. And they tell me that, oh, I'm, I don't like flying. I'm real nervous about it. I'm like, ah, you know, in a Super Cub, it's a little different. You got your own seat. It's a window seat, window seat on both sides. You can like, you got great visibility. Mm -hmm. Most people are totally comfortable. He's like, well, I'm going hunting with my daughter. And, and it's a big deal to her, so I'm just, I'm just going to go, but I'm just not going to open my eyes. And, I'm, and I, I laughed and whatever and loaded them up, and we take off, and uh, we're climbing out, and it's, I'm talking like I always do. Don't shut my mouth. I'm, you know, talk, mm -hmm. talk, talk. And, find, and he's just kind of quiet, and I turn around and look, and he's sitting back there in the back of the cub, eyes completely closed, will not open his eyes. And we're going, I remember going around the end of Sheep Mountain, and I, I said, oh, I said, do you seriously have your eyes closed? He's like, I haven't opened them yet. And I was like, bro, you do me a favor and just, just like, I'm just gonna lift the wing for a second. I'm gonna be super gentle and just like take a peek at the Matanuska Glacier. Just like take one look, you know? And he uh, 
and he did, he, which I thought was super brave of him. I had no idea how scared this guy was of all this, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he did, and he loved it. And he made it. We went on a long flight. Like, we hauled him way back into Talkeetons, dropped him off. He got a caribou with his daughter. It was, and then I think he soon after that passed away. And it was a super special hunt for the daughter and everything. It's it just, it was a, it's a great story. But that somebody would be so terrified of flying. He took the risk. He enjoyed the view. Took the risk and opened his eyes. <laughs> the, the perceived <laughs> risk of opening your eyes. That, that's the only story that comes. To that's me. so crazy. Yeah. It's fun. yeah. Uh, I took this guy flying last winter, and we landed on a glacier up behind. Um, Lake George there. And when we got done, he said, Daniel. And he listed all these big events in his life. And he's like, that was the best day of my life. Hmm. And I, it was mediocre flying. I mean, you know, I mean, my flying was mediocre that day, but it was a beautiful day, you know? And I, and I realized then I was like, that's addictive. The flying is great, but that's cool. That is cool. And uh, have it, watching them sort of start having life realizations and all kinds of stuff when they see this grand creation, you know. That is, yeah. <laughs> the, realistic, the realistic side of the air taxi world is so often you're so tangled up in the logistics, mm -hmm. we don't always do a great job of allowing people that to really soak. I mean, they do and they love it. And exactly kind of what, like, they get, it's like, you get done, you're like, I probably should have done more for that. You know, yeah, but, but you they, just, they, it's so much for them already. Yeah. It's like a, a connect trip, you know. It's like, come on, that's so boring. Yeah. Oh my God, that was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> we flew over those four wheelers. <laughs> so Not true. At, at over 500 feet, but you know, we yeah. flew. At, you know, yeah. I'm just like, there's four wheelers everywhere. How's this? It's, we're not. How's this special? <laughs> yeah, how's this special? <laughs> um, so, what's the next step on the glacier hut, and where can we like see that or, um, unfold? Okay. Book, all those kinds of things. So, I guess uh, the glacier hut, as it stands right now, is insulated and vapor barriered, meaning we're working on the interior, but it's not complete. Mm -hmm. I hope to have it complete by June. Bookings will be available online uh, soon. In the next couple of weeks from the website, blueiceaviation.com, uh, the whole website's doing a complete revamp. So, and the bookings will be able to take place there. It's gonna so, be by the time this airs, you, you're going to be booking. Hopefully. Yeah. yeah. Hopefully. It work, yeah. We're... I don't know. We're going to like put the link in the description of this just so people can go there and book if they want. But August and September are the only two months I'm going to take bookings for just publicly, right? And then it's going to shut down for October, November, December just because of weather and lighting. It's very difficult to mm -hmm. operate the hut. But I would like to fire back up in January or February in that mm -hmm. zone. So, yeah. anyways, and, and, and I do have a tremendous amount of video footage that I've collected during the entire build process, and I'm hoping to start editing that video, but it's going to probably be another year. I'm just I just don't have enough hours and I have a family that I like better than video editing. Mm -hmm. So I yeah. spend time with my family, but there will come a time when the, I hope good Lord willing, the entire story will get told. And that is mo more than promotional. I just enjoy the process of telling the story. Yeah. So that's the hope there. Yeah. It's, yeah. That's about all I got. Yeah. yeah. Very cool deal. It's one of the coolest things I've ever seen. And, um, go check out his YouTube channel. Thanks Daniel. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, you bet. Yep. Man. Yeah. Cool. You bet. All right, guys, so we have some bonus material after this break. But first, I wanted to tell you a little bit about how you can support these episodes. So we are funded by the generous donations of my company, Sport Aircraft Seats. <laughs> and if you are an airplane owner who is looking for seat upholstery, you can support this show by going to sportaircraftseats.com and designing your custom seat upholstery. So one of the things that makes Sport Aircraft Seat special is the process that we've created. It makes it very easy for you to get new upholstery in your airplane. You can design and order the seats right on our website. We will then custom make them according to what seat frames you have and ship them right to your door. And then you can install them yourself with little to no skill. We have instructional videos that walk you through every step of the installation process and we ship worldwide and shipping to us and canada is free so if you want to support the show open a new browser window go to sportaircraftseats.com and check us out and then come back and finish watching the rest of this video
you I enjoyed hearing you talk about your personal fun experiences and I think you um it's really encouraging to me because it, I, it just seems like you have a natural aptitude for it. Just, just the things you say. I'm not just Are trying to say recording. That. Are we still recording? Can we still record this? Yeah. <laughs> no, because you seriously, um, those are just good judgment calls, like mm-hmm. going downhill and stuff like that. That's a yeah. big one. That's one of the biggest things we deal with constantly. Looking at that, looking at this, and being like, uh, 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 and I'm man, it's like, it's like 19 times out of 20, this boy's going downhill. Mm. Like you take that tailwind. They're amazing with a tailwind. Yeah. I did do a, an uphill takeoff one time, and I had a wind. And light by yourself? I was. I had someone with me. It's actually my PA eleven. Hmm. But the runway was like uphill, uphill, and there was like enough space at the top that you could almost stop again. Oh, and then there yeah. was like run out, and and I was just like, and it was like at the edge of a mountain. And so I knew the second I got to the top, I was going to be in lift because I paraglided. I know where the lift is. And I was like, I'm going to be in lift at the top of that ridge. And so I'm going to have that going for me and everything. And I did it, and it worked. But there was, it was very low stakes. It was more than long enough. Yeah. You know, but... It, That's exactly how you build experience. Right? You right. tested something in a zone mm-hmm. where it was more than long enough. And then you, but you have this data point now. Like, oh, it's not uh, uh, yeah. Next time, half as long. I know it'll do it. Whenever I, t- whenever I tell myself, I should have said, whenever I tell myself... I know I can do it. Ooh. I, it's an immediate self-check. Really? Totally. I'm like, oh, I know I can do this. I'm like, what? then why are you having to tell yourself? If you know it. it, sounds to me, Matt, like you're trying to pump yourself up. Really? I just don't let myself, because it's just a self, it's just a, like, it's like a little alarm. I'm like, that was weird. Why did I have to tell myself that? I must be pretty unsure. Do you have alarm points like that? Because I feel like, I mean, I have an alarm point that I say, well, if I do, if that happens, then I'm done. Like I'm super done. I'm not doing whatever it is that I was planning on doing. One of the things my, my brother and I talked about when we were kids, we, he used to have this Arctic turn, this airplane we ripped around and he was going to get a label maker. I don't think, I think he, I don't know if he did it or not. I honestly don't remember. But this little label that just put it on the dash that said, um, visualize failure. And it's, that's not bad advice. Like, and it, like momentarily, let, let failure enter your mind. Don't dwell on it. Like, but let that, let that rip through your mind. What could possibly go wrong? What could possibly go wrong? But that's, that's, the, the, that's a great question. Yeah, it's right. such a great question. Huh. Mario always it's, said, you know, my brother. Yeah. He's like, if you don't have an imagination that allows you to think of what could go wrong, then you're going to be end up in that scenario and you're going to be like, oh, what do I do? So true. That whole positive thinking movement that happened. Do you remember back in the day there was this movie called The Secret? I don't remember the movie. It sort of restarted the positive thinking movement. Sort of a new age type. It's the universe and whatever you put out there, you're going to get back. And you got to just do positive thinking, positive thinking. And it, it, it's this whole thing of you go get up in the morning and say... I can take off my Super Cub in, 30, uh, in 200 feet. I can take it off in 200 feet. I can take it off in 200 feet or whatever. You're Sure, you're, I'm a millionaire. I'm, I'm rich. I am wealthy. I am good looking. Women love me. That's positive thinking, right? Yeah. Telling yourself things that aren't yet true in pre- preparation for them to be true. And, and if you ever meet someone that really buys into this mindset... They shouldn't be a pilot. They definitely shouldn't be a pilot. <laughs> because you'll be like, oh... Yeah, we could go into business and do this thing, but what if the market research we did isn't correct? And they're like, why would you utter something so negative? You have to be positive. I I mean, I've been in these situations. I like a realist. I like someone that asks questions and plans and prepares for risk. You can't do that as a pilot. Yeah. One of the things Jordan Peterson says over... Over is that, yeah. It, it, Jordan you know, Peterson? Jordan Peterson, our ability to, you know, like like run simulations on the future. Like mm. our brain is constantly running simulations yeah. on the future. Your ability to accurately do that mm-hmm. really, really uh, uh, predicts your success or failure in life. Mm. If you constantly run bad simulations mentally, it's just not going to go well. Well, you know who hates him? Who? Positive thinking group. Right. <laughs> <laughs> He's one of the most negative persons person I've ever heard of. Jordan Peterson? Oh yeah. 
But I mean, he's a gr very positive person too. Yeah, he is. Very, very, I know what you very mean. great thinker. Yeah, yeah. Right, but mm -hmm. he just is like, let's let's think this through. Let's yeah. actually think it through and analyze it. Yeah. What causes this problem? Oh, it's this thing. Well, that's a negative thing to yeah. say. <laughs> well, like, yeah, man, this cool. That's fun. Well, shoot, dude. I can't even imagine the amount of time it takes to edit this. People are like telling me that I'm, oh, I can't believe how my, how you're doing this. It's like, I'm not yeah. doing this. I come in and sit down. I do this. I mean, I am doing a lot of work meeting people for coffee and trying to, yeah. you know, like we did. I mean, we, we spent, I basically spent eight we, hours on this, right? Getting you totally. here and I then suppose, three yeah. here. And, I mean, I probably didn't have to meet Plus you for I coffee. I drank a lot of your coffee. <laughs> I didn't have to meet you for coffee that day probably with you. But like, there's sort of a courtship process, I think. That's for, interesting. You know, because someone's like trusting me big time with this. I wasn't looking at a courtship. I thought we were friends. Yeah, but I mean, like now that <laughs> I, I'm not going to call you again, you know. <laughs> but that's it's really, man. It's that's the outro. <laughs> that's the outro. <laughs> <laughs> I'm throwing myself on the floor, and storming out. <laughs>